Good evening. Welcome to the Grand Blank Township Committee of the Whole meeting on Tuesday, October 10th. Mr. Thomas, would you lead us in pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. That was a good deal. Oh, no. Could I have a motion to approve the agenda? So move. Support. Okay, the motion support. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, with that, uh, we're going to have a presentation on the MERS. Uh, Dennis, do you want to do, do public take, comment first, Scott? Um, sure, probably should do that first. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll start on the, in the back of the room. Good evening, Mr. Hurd. I didn't mean to overlook you there. It's okay. <laughs> I'm glad to see you because this was in the way. And hopefully I won't hit anything. Good evening, Ed Hurd, 7212 Porter Road. Um, I know we've done a lot of work on the fire department, okay? And I think we pretty much got uh, that all squared away. And I think the next step was parks and recreations. <clears throat> We have a 45-year-old agreement that hasn't been updated in quite in 45 years. I think it's time we uh, not kick the can anymore down the road and address that problem, because it's only going to get worse. So I hope that we can get that uh, meeting with our partners in that and get it resolved. Next item I wanted to talk about, and. Uh, I just want to shed some light on it when I read something. It's item B on uh, your agenda on Thursday to approve uh, the water lines with the CDGB money. Yeah, I, I just did some rough math on this thing of the letter that uh, you received in your packet. Whoops. And uh, a project accounting list with when I look at this, I look at it as an individual. If I own a home, and I'm assuming these homes are built normally on a street, roughly 25, 30 feet off the road. The, the township or municipality usually has on the in, at the lot line a place for you to hook up your water. That's the municipal municipality to do that, to have that there for you. So I think I'm talking about 25, 30 feet to the house, we've got to dig and put in a pipe and, uh, and connect it. This comes out to be $13,800 per household. The math. Seems awful high to me. I see somebody cringe. Total of $69,000 divided by five, it comes up to be $13,800. It's an awful lot for a resident to have to pay for a hookup. It just doesn't seem right. So I think you should scrutinize these numbers a little bit. And also I, I see under the accounting, I don't want to mess up your thing here. <laughs> Which thing? Oh, the laptop. Um, but I don't see anything on here about a meter. Who's paying for the meter? There's nothing in the list about a meter. Something else left on. So, and I don't know, maybe, Maybe I did. has our DPW ever done this? I know they can do it a lot cheaper than $13,000, or is there some misconceptions here that we have to go all the way underneath the road to get the water? And that's already our DPW's responsibility to get it to the lot line, so it shouldn't be part of the residence problem. Scrutinize a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Earth. Anybody else wish to come forward for public comment? Okay, with that, we'll move on our agenda. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, our board presentation. Mr. Limita, would you like to? Sure, so every year um, the board receives the uh, actuarial valuation uh, for our MERS um, defined benefit plan for the police department. And um, we received this one, and forgive me, I don't remember back, but it was a few months back. Uh, and then we'd like to schedule a uh, presentation shortly thereafter. 
so that the, the board gets an opportunity to, to number one, uh, hear MERS walk through some of the highlights of our actual plan versus uh, you know the statewide average and some of the things that we've done. But I think one of the key points always is that this board has been very proactive in looking at how we reduce our unfunded liability mm -hmm. and how much progress we're making uh, on, in those areas by some of the actions we take, whether it's through contract negotiations or just with uh, when we're bringing down our general fund uh, balance to the appropriate level and where we're, where we're investing that money at. And Matt from MERS is here and is going to give the presentation for the board. Uh, and again, I think if you guys just um, pay particular attention to the progress that we've made, uh, I'm sure he'll touch a little bit upon um, the change in the assumptions that went along with the actuarial evaluation and uh, that has had some impact on it. But I think it was very positive news, our 2015 to 2016. And with that, Matt. Yeah, yes, thank you, Dennis. Uh, does, does everybody have a, I think? Uh, I don't. Yeah, everybody has one. Yeah. No. Thank you. You have another one? Scott needs one. You right. guys have one? And, I, and we'll need one for uh, Al because right. Ken just took the one I had for Al. Not me. I have the one that this gentleman gave me. All right. That'll be for Al. Thank you. I just wanted to mention, too, uh, Al isn't here due to a, a death of his father. Uh, so, Al Mansour. You know, before we start this, Supervisor Bennett, maybe we should take a second and have a, a brief moment of silence for Al and his father and his family. Sure. Okay. We'll take a moment of silence for Mr. Munster. Thank you. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry for your, for your loss. I know that you are uh, abandoning some uh, swords, and, uh, and uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Dennis, for the introduction. We are going to talk uh, at a high level about uh, some of the uh, some of the funding, uh, your, or some, how our municipalities are funded, and specific uh, to your to your group. Uh, so thank you for having me. Thank me again. My name is Matt Taylor. I'm a regional manager uh, for MERS. I'd like to thank Kathy for helping me organize this and put things together. So uh, without further ado. So again, we're going to talk about MERS as a company. Just a real brief uh, overview. I'm sure you all are, are familiar. Kathy, you shared that you're very familiar. Uh, so probably won't be any surprises there for you. Uh, but then how a defined benefit works, uh, how UAL uh, is being managed, and I, I hope to share with you what our other uh, municipalities are, are doing out there. Uh, so we are an independent, not-for-profit uh, retirement administrator. Uh, we provide services, uh, administrative services, as well as investment services. We uh, help manage over 84% of the municipalities in the state of Michigan. Uh, we have 100,000 participants uh, in our plan, and we manage uh, just over $10 billion worth of total assets. Please feel free to, to stop me at any time as well. Uh, we too are, are managed or um, overseen by an elected a board of officials uh, that is comprised of three employees, three employers, uh, two uh, members are private sector folks, and we also have one retiree. Uh, these folks oversee the plan document, uh, so the, 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 the plan itself, uh, but then they also oversee the investments made by MERS. Uh, you'll hear this a little bit as we, as we talk about uh, the legislative um, piece as well, uh, but it is MERS' position that each municipality uh, has different needs, and we have product, uh, products that we feel suit uh, each of those needs. Uh, we have nine customizable uh, products uh, currently, uh, but we also are listening to what's going on out there, uh, and we are creating new products uh, to help our municipalities. Uh, one, of, one example of that would be our DC Plus, which is the Defined Contribution Plus uh, program that is now available, and that is the marriage at a very high level. That is the marriage of Defined Contribution with the 457 uh, Deferred Savings Plan. Uh, we believe that this gives our employees a great deal 
uh, a great deal of flexibility in their savings for our retirement. And that's what we're hearing uh, a lot of. So how do these products shake out uh, on the whole uh, with our groups? Uh, we have about 89% uh, of our groups, 725, are in the, have a defined benefit, <coughs> benefit program. Uh, about 10% are in the hybrid or have a hybrid uh, plan. And then, uh, excuse me, 30% or 321 groups have the defined contribution. So that kind of gives you a feel. I know you're hearing a lot out there. Uh, this is how it shakes out. Are you seeing growth in the defined contribution and hybrid? <clears throat> we are, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a graph of, of okay. the changes that we're seeing uh, made here shortly, but okay. uh, yes, it's a, it's a very popular uh, topic. Uh, you may have also noticed that that number doesn't equal 100%, and that is because a lot of our groups have some combination of all these products. Uh, so they have a defined benefit and a defined contribution and a 457, uh, as well as some of our, our healthcare products as well. So defined benefit, very high level, uh, uh, comprised of three components, final average compensation, uh, which is typically 36 months of your highest consecutive wages, or 60 months, five years of your highest consecutive wages. Uh, that gets confused sometimes. It's not a calendar year. It's highest consecutive wages. Uh, the service credit, very sim uh, simply put, it is how much time you put in uh, with the municipality and then the benefit multiplier. The benefit multiplier is negotiated uh, by the employer. Uh, this typically ranges between one and 3% uh, with a uh, general rule, uh, the higher the higher multipliers you, are typ you would typically find in your public safety, uh, public safety groups, typically. Any questions so far? So again, uh, the defined benefit is a lifetime, uh, a lifetime benefit offered uh, from employer to employee. Uh, it does not fluctuate with the marketplace. Um, it does, so in cases of 2008, uh, that benefit does not change. It stays the same for the rest of that employee, employee's uh, life. So defined benefit plans are pre-funded uh, pre uh, during the employee's career. Uh, contributions are typically made by both the employee and employer, no different here. Your group uh, has, has both of these components, um, uh, both, both contributing and then uh, the investments uh, are going to be, uh, we, we hope to help pay out the retire and, uh, retirement, uh, retirees, <coughs> uh, retirement benefit. So MERS strategically invests in contributions with a prudent long-term approach uh, to provide downside protection 2008 with upside participation. We talked a little bit about that uh, uh, earlier. Um, we have a very diversified portfolio uh, invested by uh, folks that we have in-house, where it's about 30% right now, and then we go uh, outside of MERS for the, uh, for the balance. Um, I think you're going to see um, I think you're gonna see that number grow. Uh, we're doing that both with our, uh, with our actuarial folks and with our investment folks, meaning that they are in-house, uh, in our, our, set on our uh, headquarter building. And I think you're gonna, my guess is that you're gonna see more of that as a cost savings measure um, going forward. So I mentioned this uh, uh, prior, but MERS investment earnings actually uh, help fund uh, more than half of the benefits that go, uh, go out the door. I think that's important to note. Um, certainly the funding level uh, will affect that, how much the investments can be directly applied to retiree benefits. Uh, pension plans are built for the long term. Um, if you look at the investment, uh, I keep referring to 2008, but it's something that comes up a lot in, in these conversations for um, for reasons you might guess, but if you look at the at the plan over the last 34 years, if you would have invested $10,000 with MERS, um, if you look at our assumed rate, which was 8% over the major the vast majority of those years, we did just change that uh, to 775. Uh, but you would you would have seen a 68% increase over that amount of time, which is pretty pretty substantial. Um, I think <coughs> the point here is 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 steady over long periods of time. 
we returned over 11% last year, um, and then I think negative 1% the year before. And I think you're going to see more of that uh, as the market is more volatile uh, with low bond ratings and, and um, uh, interest rates as they are. So the goal uh, is to become 100% funded over time. That's another change that MERS has made. Uh, we do have a fixed amortization policy now. Uh, so all of our municipalities, all of our groups are on schedule uh, to be fully funded in 22 years. Uh, we're now in year one, if you will, of that. Um, I, I think the goal would, would be obvious, but this is a, this is a big change. Uh, you are seeing um, year to year reamortization or, or um, like a more home mortgage refinance every year or rolling. Uh, now we are on a fixed 22 years, but you have to, um, I would, I would say with that in mind, uh, these are also based on assumptions. We can't control how long folks are going to, are going to be in the plan with us. Uh, and then what the, the investment returns are going to be. But as it stands, we are on schedule to be 100% funded with all of our groups in 22 years. The valuation that Dennis mentioned, uh, you'll see a lot of that information in there in, in more detail. I didn't think that was appropriate for this evening, uh, but it is, there is a copy inside uh, the packet that I, that I shared with you all. So this is how uh, uh, our, our groups are looking funded wise. Uh, um, I, I think what you, you, know, you might be hearing out there uh, may not be what you see here. Um, I, would, I would say this is a pretty um, normal bell, if you will. Uh, we have uh, over 65 groups are over 100% funded uh, with the core group of our municipalities being in between uh, uh, 60 percent and 80 uh, percent. We, ch we chatted a little bit earlier about uh, funding and how that's going to look with the legislator. I think this is legislation coming up or not coming up. We expect that there will be, but um, it, it is something to note that 60 percent has been used as a threshold to determine whether the health of a municipality's plan. Um, I would I would say that you know. Each, uh, each municipality, uh, the health of their plan um, is just one moment in time. And I think when you think of it actuarially, it doesn't always say exactly, it doesn't tell the whole story. But I think from everything, not what I think, what we're hearing uh, and the recommendation that was given from the task force that was put together by Governor Snyder, that 60% would be a, a, a number to use to determine, does this municipality, uh, do we need to look further into this? Um, what are the changes being made, if any? Uh, those types of questions would come about at, at that 60% threshold. The other part of that is, is the, the recommendation was to uh, build or, or put together a stability board, and a stability board would be responsible for identifying uh, your 63% funded, what actions have you taken? Well, we've made extra contributions. Uh, we've made changes to our provisions. We're on a 22-year amortization. Um, in theory, that answer would be, okay, great. Keep on, stay on your road. Uh, you, you're doing the right things. Um, if that's not the case and that's not found, then there would be further actions taken. That's very general. That's what we have uh, thus far. So currently, uh, Grand Blank Charter Township is funded at 63%. That's uh, as of the 2016 valuation. Uh, that's up uh, 5% uh, from the last valuation. I would commend you all for making the extra contributions, uh, making ch uh, changes to, to, uh, to get there. Um, that's a pretty substantial jump uh, considering the ex uh, experience study and other happenings in the world, if you will. I'll talk a little bit more about the experience study here in a second. Now, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I'm sorry. I uh, just had about 30, 30 minutes of my... As long as it's good news, you can have all the time you want. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, um, I, uh, Trustee Kent on the app. He does this. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, you're, no one's asleep yet, so I feel like uh, that's an accomplishment. Of, uh, and it, it's awesome. So... Um, I'll try to move through this uh, 
uh, quickly to, to kind of wrap up, but uh, I wanted to make a point of the uh, phase in and, and no phase in uh, minimum contribution. So currently the no phase in <coughs> contribution is the default. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's what we, that's what you'll see in the valuation. The no phase in, um, it, it, it is uh, a, uh, when we put together <coughs> the experience study in 2015, we executed an experience study. What the experience study is, and, and the, um, in, this, in this past weekend of football, I'm gonna make it a football analogy. And what, what it is is that, you know, when we're heading into a football Saturday, we hear about the weather, we hear about the health of the team, we hear about this team uh, wins when it's sunshiny, and you know, we hear all of this going into the game. Well, then after the game is played, we can look back, well, were those, <coughs> were those um, predictions accurate? That's what the experience study is. We look back on the assumptions. Did we return <coughs> the, uh, the assumption that we, we had hoped, uh, 775? Uh, are people in the plan living as long as we expected, so on and so forth? Uh, by doing that, in this last experience study, uh, we did, make the, we did uh, determine that uh, folks are going to live, or live longer, um, good news for all of us. Uh, bad news for cost of pension plans, and that the return uh, is going to be a little bit lower at 775. That creates unfunded accrued liability. The no phase in would be paying that unfunded accrued liability over five years. So it's going to be a little bit more, and that's what that's that's what you'll see on your on your val. That actual chart is in your valuation. So there are two ways to uh, address unfunded accrued liability. Uh, <coughs> One, through funding strategies, and I'm gonna to touch on those. Uh, the other is, uh, is through uh, design strategies. So what are your provisions, how much do they cost, and do we want to adjust those? Uh, the, uh, the hybrid plan was thrown around, I heard that earlier, defined going to a contrib defined contribution, what are the costs related, uh, so on and so forth. So it's two ways. You can uh, uh, fund uh, more funding into the plan uh, or change the plan. 73% of our groups uh, have, have made some uh, type of change, falling into either of those two buckets or both. So these two, these two slides I feel like will be very helpful for you all to see what other groups uh, are doing. Um, I'm gonna touch real, really quick on each, but uh, lowering a benefit to new hires, this is just creating a new benefit um, at, a, at a lower cost to the employer. Uh, bridge benefits, uh, this is specific to the defined benefit. Uh, this is changing the multiplier for an employee. Uh, so once you've, you've set for a bridge benefit to start in, let's say, January 1st of 2018, that employee that had a 2.5, um, arbitrary numbers, 2.5% multiplier would receive all of the benefit uh, that they had accrued up until January 1st, and then following January 1st, they would be uh, whatever multiplier you have decided upon, uh, they would accrue their benefit from there forward at that level. Uh, so cost savings to the employer, um, that was, uh, as you see here, a uh, very um, popular, for a lack of a better word, in the uh, year 2016, we have 45 uh, groups decide to make that change. Hybrid plan, uh, again, very high level. Uh, this is the marriage of defined benefit and uh, defined contribution, so you're gonna have a lower multiplier defined benefit, or a less costly, if you will, and this is gonna be paired with a defined contribution <coughs> where employees are gonna be making uh, uh, contributions. So um, in the munis municipal uh, world, this is referred to as a 401A uh, for, by the IRS designation, but in theory and what you hear, uh, this is a 401K pl plan, and it's marrying the two. <coughs> Uh, defined uh, benefit freezes, uh, we're seeing very few of those. Uh, I believe um, a good portion, if not all of that eight number you see in two, six, 2016 uh, were due to folks going to uh, privatization. Um, so I don't know how, I, I don't know if they, that that's, this is a direct impact here, but uh, just to give you a feel. Uh, funding strategies, again, I would commend, uh, commend you all. Uh, you made an con uh, additional contribution of 300 and over 340,000, 48,000, I believe, 
uh, last year, it does have a direct uh, impact on your uh, funding. Um, so there are a couple of different ways here. You can certain, uh, certainly have employees paying more uh, and then also make over and above uh, additional contributions. Those would be the two um, choices here. Uh, you'll see that the voluntary contributions kind of leading the way in, in changes that our municipalities made. Uh, bonding is also another option. Uh, certainly not a uh, something you know we would have a conversation about tonight. Um, a little more complex. Uh, some of our groups have found that was best for them. Again, MERS <laughs> believes that each municipality should make the decision that's best for their group. So this is your flow of uh, flow of assets. You're going to see uh, you're going to see this in the in the valuation as well. This is directly from your from your valuation. Um, I think the thing to note here is that you're if you're moving from left to right from the bottom, uh, 2016, you're going to see the if, if you add that uh, required contribution employer with the additional that you made over three. Three hundred forty-eight thousand, I believe that says, and then uh, the employee contributions. When you add those together, you're going to get a good idea um, of how much the MERS investments are working for you. Um, in this case, you're 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 covering the benefits paid, which are are benefit payments. They're in parentheses, uh, one, two, three, four over. Um, so I I would recommend or or suggest. Uh, looking at those numbers every year in the valuation, I'll give you a good feel for it. That it's no different than your personal checkbook. If more is going out than it, it is coming in, um, that's maybe a time to be um, to be on alert. Um, the the additional contribution um, will get you to a point in time where you're fully funded quicker, and therefore will be able to put more of that investment money uh, out the door to retirees. Um, your demographics relatively um it's not um it's not really real mature so i you know there's not any uh so, you know big concern there uh, but the thought is that more you know folks will continue to retire and, the, and that cost will go up uh, again uh so here's the trend uh this this is directly from your valuation um Matt, yes question mr massey yeah. yes mr matt I have a question. At the pace you see the township is at, is on, I should say, mm -hmm. in the next five to ten years, where do you think the township will be? Oh, boy. Uh, that's a, it's a really good question. Um, I, I would be fearful of making that, that suggestion, but I, I, it's, a, it's a very good question, and we, in, in, the, value, in the valuation, uh, actuarial, actuarially, we do provide that information, and I can direct you to that. I personally probably wouldn't wouldn't want to to, to on record give you a number. Uh, I would feel uncomfortable about that. Yeah, Mr. Limina. But I think as we walk through this, a couple of the things key is when he talked about those voluntary contributions, we yes. have done that, and, and this board has directed us as uh, we we bring back um, our general fund balance into the 12 to 15 percent range that um, the board's adopted uh, comfort zone that where we've directed those are to our unfunded liabilities both in health care and in pension now that's where the voluntary contributions came from we intend to make a very sizable voluntary contribution again at the end of 2017 uh, and then the adoption of the full impact is key because that was negotiated in the contracts that rather than um, let that uh, phase in over five years, uh, we've agreed with the employees that we're going to adopt that full impact of, you know, as the changes to the assumptions occur, um, we want to we, we want to continue to push that. And so we've taken two steps that really do address uh, that unfunded liability and again I understand Matt not wanting to put himself out because all a big part of this is what our investments do as well um, on where will where we could we be in five years or ten years um, if he knew the answer to that question he probably wouldn't be standing here tonight because he would have a secret about investments that I don't know <laughs> yeah I mr. Kent well that's I want to make sure I understand what I'm reading here from the actuarial so based on trustee Massey's comment and, and mr. Limita I'm, I'm going to ask Matt, uh, from using your phase-in and no phase-in calculations, 
it appears we can become 100% funded in 10 years by increasing our funding by $15,000 per month. That's only $180,000 a year, folks. On a $1.3 million, I mean, I'm sorry, $13 million budget, if we can't find $180,000, we all need to just resign. <laughs> and I mean that. Those, I'm sorry, go ahead. So is that correct? Those, more those and those, those were the, um, uh, the, those were, the, I, I believe it gives you a 10 and a 20 year uh, projection. And those were what I, w I was referring to. Um, that'll give you a feel, but I want to make clear, it is actuarial. It, it is. It's that, based on everything, the performance of, of the through uh, December 31st, 16, correct? Yes. Okay, yes. so uh, you know, I want to qualify that as well. Based on that performance, if we continue to do that every year and we find an additional 15000 per month to contribute, which we, over, we, we did more than that last year on an over contribution. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's my goal, folks. So, and to that point, um, Trustee Kent, the fifteen thousand dollars a month, you know, and they have in the actual um, actuary. I'll tell you that to accelerate to one hundred percent funding ratio, he's exactly right. An additional fifteen thousand a month, but over that ten-year period, we're talking about one point eight million dollars over ten years. Then you add in investments, whatever. But that one point eight million, if you look at what the investment that we intend to make this year yes. and add it to the, what we made last year yes. for the voluntary contributions, that's over a million dollars, yes. folks. So, I mean, we're, you, you want to talk about aggressively going yes. after it. We're very aggressively going after it. Perfect. And then we can work on the unfunded uh, retiree health care. Well, we're, you know, we're doing it at the same time. But, I mean, I think this right. one, uh, we made a, a sizable commitment to um, health care for this year as well. Right. And, uh, you know, we're talking about upwards of $700,000 um, commitment this year to, to put towards that. So that's a heck of an impact. Very, very commendable. Uh, we, we, are, we are seeing that with, with our other groups, and, and I, I would commend you all on, on the uh, steps that you've taken to address the unfunded accrued liability. Uh, that's the end of my um, presentation. I know you have a lot to get through tonight. I'll take any other uh, quick questions if there are any. And I would, I'm sorry, I'm like, okay. uh, I will be your point of contact going forward. You all have my contact information in your packet. Uh, we do have uh, products, and this isn't a plug, it's a, and it's an awareness, uh, that we do have healthcare um, uh, products um, available that um, we feel are a good fit for um, helping that, that OPEP piece as well, which isn't required by the state of Michigan. So anyway, thank you all, and I enjoyed being here tonight. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. Mr. Taylor. Thank you. And now we will have a presentation. Uh, Mr. Lima, did you want to have any words before we bring this is again, Director um, Kathy? As Director Sostak uh, approaches the podium, this is again one of the uh, presentations that we've asked all of our department heads to do on a um, rotating basis so that we continue to share information uh, and make the board uh, more familiar with some of the things that are going on uh, as far as from including goals that uh, the departments may have, and they're kind of going to give you a rundown of roles and responsibilities, who does what. I think everybody has a pretty decent understanding of uh, what the finance department does, um, but I think it's, it's good to have her here and, and be able to walk everybody through just not only to make sure we have a clear understanding of what they do, but then to listen to more about the future and goals. Kathy has done a tremendous amount for this township in the three years she has been here. Uh, three years this month, um, and she she has made just unbelievable recommendations for us that we continue to act upon. And, you know, she's still got some further goals that she wants to carry out. So I couldn't be happier to than to have her here in front of the board tonight because she's just to me has just been a uh, we could have done a better job when the board hired uh, Kathy as finance director, and I I think you'll see that tonight and when she talks about her goals moving forward. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you. Um, yeah, tonight we're here to discuss uh, the roles and responsibilities of the finance department. Uh, first of all, let me start out with the staff. Uh, myself as finance director, um, as Dennis mentioned, I'll be here three years uh, at the end of this month. Um, my sta senior staff accountant is Yvonne Wagner. She's been with the township about six years and three and a half of those in the finance department. And uh, our newest hire is Heather Payer. She was hired in as a staff accountant and she'll be here almost three months. 
So typically when you think of the activities of a finance department, you think of the dollars, the money that goes in and out. Um, and that is essentially what we do. We are the part of the organization that manages the money. And um, the activities of the finance department can cover a wide range of activities from some of the basic bookkeeping um, to providing information to all the various departments and assisting them and the managers in making strategic decisions. Uh, some of the functions of the finance department, they include planning, organizing, auditing, accounting for, and controlling the finances. And from the big picture view, these are five of the uh, major areas of responsibility. Trying to um, narrow it down is a difficult thing to do, but um, try to account for these and all in about five different areas within the finance department. Uh, first of that being budgeting. Uh, second is the uh, accounts receivable and revenue tracking. That's all the money coming in. Third being the money going out, the accounts payable function. Uh, fourth is the reporting and financial statements. And the last um, and one of the more important is the financial controls. So typically it all kind of starts with the budget. So on an annual basis we prepare a budget and the budget must be approved by the governing body prior to the beginning of the fiscal year and that's a requirement by the state of Michigan, uh, their Uniform Budgeting and Accounting Act. The budget, uh, the components of the budget, uh, first of all you need the revenue in order to spend the money you have to bring the money in first, so the revenue projections. We take and look at all the various accounts within the um, general ledger, all the revenue accounts, and make estimates to the best of our knowledge as to what those dollars will be. From there, we do the expenditure projections. Um, some of the components of that, uh, the personnel, we look at the various contracts and um, base the wages and fringes upon that. Uh, the department had requests. We uh, send out um, worksheets for the departments to all look at at the beginning of the budget process and they give us our request. They send that back and we incorporate that into the budget. Um, also my department um, takes care of the finance department budget as well as any that aren't specific to a department. Um, for instance like retiree health care that's across all funds and all departments so we take care of the budgeting for that. Now we also do the special revenue funds both the revenue expenditures for all of those. And the last thing involving budgets, while we try to do our best to project out what those revenues and expenditures are going to be, um, there's always some variances that occur throughout the year. So that's where the budget amendments come in. Those happen throughout the year, and we bring those to the board for their approval. Next uh, area is, do, is the accounts receivable and revenue tracking. This is where all the money comes in. So we, on a daily basis, we do cash review and balancing. While we don't actually handle the physical cash that's taken in by the treasurer's office, um, we actually reconcile it and um, account for it, record the entries on the general ledger. Uh, the next is miscellaneous invoicing, and this relates to the receivables too. Anything out there that um, is owed to the township, we make sure we invoice for it. Um, we account for and track all of those receivables and then recording the revenue. The three largest sources of revenue in this order are the property taxes, uh, state and federal sources, and the licenses and permits, and then all other income after that. The next function is the accounts payable function. This is where we essentially pay all the bills. We uh, receive and review invoices from all the vendors. There's approximately 4,300 invoices on an annual basis that we process. Um, we monitor the projects, the large projects, to ensure that they're in compliance with the board approval. If the board says this project cannot exceed $200,000, we make sure as we pay the bills we don't exceed $200,000 on it. <coughs> and then recording the entries in the accounting system, and then we uh, print checks and pro or process any ACH payments. Some of them are instead of a check being sent out are done through ACH. And then throughout the entire AP process we're always looking to see if there's ways to save money, any opportunities, if there's any available discounts or incentives. For instance if we pay an invoice sometimes within 10, 20 days you'll get a, an incentive or a discount on it. So we make sure we try as, um, as much as possible to 
to uh, save any money we can for the township. So we ensure that the least amount of money goes out and make sure there's no late payments or late fees. We try and get everything paid on time. Next function is record keeping, and this occurs throughout the year. Um, some of those include bank reconciliations. We currently have uh, 25 bank accounts. Um, that includes nine checking and 16 money market accounts that are reconciled monthly. Uh, general ledger account reconciliation. Uh, there's approximately 1,800 active general ledger accounts at this point in time. The fixed asset records. This is all our land, land improvements, buildings, equipment. We account for all that. Take care of depreciation schedules at the end of the year. Uh, utility building. We create the file for the outgoing utility bills and do any adjustments to that. Um, also function as the payroll backup. Uh, payroll was previously in this department but has now moved to human resources but we still actually our newest employee just started training on that this week and she'll be the payroll backup person. Uh, we also maintain credit card controls and um, recording journal entries. Approximately 8,500 entries are processed annually. That includes both uh, system generated entries and manual entries. One thing I wanted to touch on tonight is fund accounting. It's kind of how we just governmental accounting um, differs from private sector accounting. Um, the accounting system that governments used is known as fund accounting. It's um, and governmental units and nonprofit units typically use fund accounting. And it emphasizes accountability rather than the profitability. Um, essentially, the goal is to cover your costs of providing the service and no more than that. You don't want to have a lot of extra dollars sitting around. Um, since it's taxpayer dollars, we just want to cover our cost and that's about it. So uh, in the system, though, we have um, funds and each fund is a self-balancing set of accounts. And it's typically set up for specific purposes. If there's any sort of regulations or specific restrictions on the dollars, we open up a separate fund for those. And currently, Grand Lake Township has 22 separate funds. Okay, review and compliance. Um, this is where we ensure that um, we're in compliant with generally accepted accounting principles, also known as GAAP. Uh, we monitor the budget throughout the, the year. Uh, if you notice monthly, there's a um, budget to actual report included in your packet. So that's, you can see where we're, our, we're progressing throughout the year. We monitor that to make sure if there's any accounts or areas over budget, we can amend it at that point in time. Um, also financial controls. These include uh, reconciliations. Um, we make sure there's appropriate separation of duties. Uh, for example, uh, the person who actually handles, that's why the cash, the physical cash is handled in the treasurer's office and then we reconcile for it. You don't want the same person handling cash and booking the entries for it as well. Uh, we make sure the gap standards of accounting principles are being followed and um, these are all implemented in compli for compliance purposes but also to prevent any fraud and theft. Uh, we also oversee the annual audit. Um, we typically, once the fiscal year ends in December, January and February are spent reconciling the books, preparing various schedules for the audit. Um, and then the auditors typically come in March and they spend three to four weeks here reviewing all of our books. They obviously take samples, they can't review everything, but um, they're on site for about three to four weeks uh, doing all the field work. So once the um, audit is complete, then we can actually move on to the preparation of the financial statements or the comprehensive annual financial report. And that is this report here, which the auditors typically present. Um, it actually contains more than just financial statements. There's notes to the financials, which ex give a little bit further detail. There's a management discussion and analysis. And in the back, there's statistical information so it gives about 10 years worth of um, comparis for comparison purposes. So you can see where we're progressing. Um, once the CAFR is prepared, we also take and submit that to the Government Finance Officers Association. And they have a Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting Program. 
so it's reviewed. It's kind of a further step to take it beyond the audit um, for assurance purposes that we're actually in, in compliance. Uh, there's also a number of state reporting requirements that we do every year. Um, some of those include the F-65 report, uh, qualifying statement. Qualifying statement is what allows us, it's a pre-approval for bonds, for issuing bonds. Um, if you don't do the qualifying statement, if you were to <coughs> issue bonds that year, you would have to go and get state approval before you can do that. Uh, there's the Metro Act report that's uh, regarding the telecom uh, right-of-ways. And then uh, about five, six years ago, the state um, started put, put in requirements in order to receive your revenue sharing. And that's in the form of the, uh, the performance dashboard, citizen's guide, uh, debt service report, and projected budget report. Those four documents need to be submitted in order for us to receive our revenue sharing now. And then most recently, just started this year, was the summary annual reports. That's in regards to our unfunded liabilities, um, both our DB plan and um, OPEB. Now there's a requirement for us to submit a report to the state for their review on that. And uh, lastly, some of our future goals. Um, we'd like to, well, ongoing process and implementation of the new gas fee pronouncements. Uh, typically, there's at least one or two <coughs> that affect us every year. Um, the one coming up will be GASB 75, and this has, this is, where they're now requiring us to uh, recognize the OPEB liability on the financial statements. We're in the back, it was just in the notes, it wasn't actually hitting the statements. So you're gonna see a dramatic difference in our financial statements at that point in time. Um, they're not, there's no changes as far as funding it, just still not being required to fund it, but, um, but obviously it's a good idea to do as much as we can towards that. Uh, the state came out with a new uniform chart of accounts. That's what our general ledger is built upon, and it's more for, um, so for comparison purposes. So you can compare one municipality to the next. We, um, currently this, the accounts, some of them are compliant with the uniform chart of accounts, but they have made changes to it, so we'll have to take and review every one of our general ledger accounts and make sure it's not compliant with the new chart of accounts. Um, also a paperless accounts payable system. We currently process 4,300 invoices annually. Um, and right now, everybody signs off on a paper, brings it over, we process it, and we have to keep these all on file. So what we wanna do is make that paperless. That would just be entered into the system, will come over to us electronically, we'll process it, and it'll also help from a standpoint of when somebody wants some information, as opposed to us having to go pull all the individual files, it'll just be able to access it all in the BSNA system. Uh, financial forecasting. Uh, this is something I would like to implement here within the next year or so. Um, it would kind of give us a look at, it would take this year's budget and kind of carry it out about five years and um, kind of give us a heads up if we have any areas of concern that we need to look at um, before it actually happens. And uh, the last is uh, review and <coughs> consolidation of bank accounts. As I mentioned before, we have, currently have 25 bank accounts. I think we can reduce that considerably and um, save money on fees. Um, it might be a good time to also look at the bank that we're using right now. Um, we're being hit more recently with more and more fees, so it might be a good time to look at that as well. So this concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to entertain any questions at this point in time. Thank you. Mr. Massey. Uh, Director Kathy, I have a question. You mentioned the project does not exceed 200,000. Can you expound on that? You were using that as no, an I example. No, I would just use that as an example. It oh, says okay. if, if the board approves $200,000 for a project, we make sure the bills going out to pay that project don't exceed the 200,000. Oh, okay. Mr. Guzak? Oh, there you had your hand up. Oh, okay. Mr. Kent? Through you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Uh, Kathy, the the report to OPEB, the state report that we have to send to, for the OPEB mm -hmm. uh, results, are you, are you qualified to send that? We don't have to have a certif somebody certified to send that in. We, in house, yeah. we can do that. No fees. Great, great, okay. great. No, it's just a summary annual report. Uh, the state gave the requirements specifics that they want in the report. Okay. I 
completed the usually report. They, it's actually out on our website too if you'd like to take a look okay. at it. Usually that's one of those things that they attach it. You gotta have somebody certified to send that report in. You know, I'm thinking like the environmental stuff. Anyway, okay, okay. great. It was interesting because they didn't exactly provide clear direction. I okay. think when we put our <laughs> summer annual report together, we talked about it and said, well, um, and then you had to include. Didn't a really section. give you a time frame, yeah. Yeah, they include in section on what you're what you're doing to address any unfunded liability. So we try to see if there's other clarification out there. And everybody's typical state of Michigan. They're like, well, we'd like you to have it done and and done on time. But there's no specific time frame and there's no specific format you have to follow. So I'm sure ours was right because there was no way for it to be wrong. I mean, it was just one of those things. So, uh, but it is on the website for people to see, and it's it's about leaning more towards the transparency. Okay. Good, good view. Very nice presentation. I think it uh, really covered a lot of ground. And uh, even though I've been here for a little while, it, it still, I think, covered all the bases. Yep. Very thorough. Thank you. We also, I think, have received an award f for a number of years now, too, with, with their accounting practices, right? I'm not sure the title of that award. Certificate of Achievement. Yep. Okay. That was a GFOA, okay. the Government Finance Officers Association, mm -hmm. yes. So congratulations on Thank you. earning that for our township as well. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. You're welcome. Appreciate it. And now we'll move to reviewing our agenda for Thursday, October 12th, our regular meeting. You want to bring the cable up here? I don't know if you're just going to leave that on, Kathy, or okay, I can just do that. either way, I'll plug it into my laptop if. Okay, okay here I'll take that. End. I'll take that end. He wants to plug yeah, it. I'll plug it in here. It's just so we don't have a black screen. Okay, on uh, Thursday, we'll go through the minutes. I don't know if anybody has forwarded any changes to Kathy, but I did notice a change in the format. So uh, with that, then we'll go to our consent agenda. We'll have the treasurer's report. And then we'll also uh, have in our consent agenda, the CDBG funds we'll be using for public water connection project. And then we had some comments on that. If there's any questions on that issue or Mr. Sears, do you want to briefly update us on that project? Representatives here from that. Okay, fine. I'd love to. Good evening. Good evening. Um, before you, you have a proposal to award a contract to W.T. Stevens Construction out of Flint, Michigan for the connection of five homes on the presidential streets off of Fenton Road to the public water supply. Um, as you may recall, we discussed this previously in the year. It's a project being funded by CDBG grant funds. Um, we previously discussed capital fees. Capital fees are included in the grant monies. So the actual <coughs> connection cost comes out to about $10,206 per house. Um, and then there's $3,600 in capital fees for each home that's being paid out of the grant. Uh, with five houses, it does mean that the township will pay about $4,000 of the project costs, which is normal for any kind of uh, grant funded program that we have, just like this one. So um, that's the gist of the project. I can answer any questions that you might have. To repeat that again, Jeff, that it's normal for us to pay the $4,000? Well, any, pro any project that we might have, uh, grant funded or not, is going to have costs associated with the township. In this case, $4,000 is minimal for connecting five houses to the public water supply. Any normal house would, uh, that came to us, we would collect the capital fee and then we would tap in to the water main for them. In this case, we're getting paid for the capital fee and the water tap itself, where previously we wouldn't get paid for that water tap. The grant is also paying to physically connect the home to the water mm -hmm. system also, which means running the line up to the house disconnecting the well, capping the well, and connecting the internal plumbing to the public water supply too. How is the price compared? I mean, 
have the prices on this gone up with the Flint uh, project going on? Or? Well, you know, that, that's kind of hard to say because I, I, we don't do a whole lot of projects like this. I, I don't think it's out of line by any means. We did only get one bid, unfortunately. The bids did go out twice. The first bid opening, Clerk Lane and I conducted, we didn't get any bids. So we were luckily, luckily, lucky enough to get one bid this time. Um, I don't think they're out of line for what we're doing here, no. Mr. Ken? Is this uh, the, t the, t the little over 10000 per home, is it kind of a economy of scale here? Is it one of those things where if we had 20 homes versus absolutely. we only got five, right? Absolutely. If okay. we had more homes, I, you're absolutely dead on right with that. Okay. Yeah. Is this a project uh, something the DPW could do in the future? Or? Not really, because it does require boring under the road. Uh, in our township, we have water main on one side of the road, down any road, not both. So some of these homes, I think three of them, actually are bores. And we can't perform bores in-house, nor would I want to. So mm -hmm. um, not really. Uh, plus, I wouldn't want to put my technicians in the position where we're in somebody's home working or on their property working. Generally, if the DPW were to complete a water tap, we would tap the water main and run the, the uh, service up to the property line, and that's it. Mm -hmm. The homeowner is responsible from there. Ms. Lane? Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are two representatives here of the particular company that won the bid if you wanted to introduce them so that at least we know who we're, who is working with us. Uh, Mr. Sears, do you want to introduce them? They're absolutely, I haven't actually met them myself, so uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, uh, I believe the young lady that came to the bid opening. Uh, right. Hi, uh, my name is Beverly Green, we're on the WTC construction, and I'm the construction services director. Hi, Beverly Green, I'm the construction services director. This is um, Don Stevens, and he's the vice president of the company. And private manager, and uh, Okay, thank you. Thank Mr. Massey. Mr. Chief. Uh, Dr. Sears, I have a question. Yes, sir. Can you have uh, public water and a well? Uh, you can. Um, that's that's uh, a little bit tricky. You can, in the township, we can allow a water well to exist for irrigation purposes only but it has to be completely disconnected from the home's interior plumbing. So if somebody wanted to keep a well and uh, have a spigot on the outside of their home, they could still do that, but it cannot be connected to any potable uh, water source for the house. So there cannot be any kind of connection whatsoever between the public water supply and the well. So if, if uh, you, know, you had a well and we were gonna install public water there, you could disconnect it from your home's plumbing, but leave it connected to one outside spigot, and that's it. But no, you cannot mix the two water sources. It's a cross connection. Thank you. Mr. Kahn? All right, I'll just say what I was thinking. Yeah, Jeff, um, I, I always thought, and, and, and maybe Mr. Laddie could interject, I always thought we, the connection could not be internal to the home. Right. We're, aren't we inviting ourselves for problems or you, you know, are, cross connections? If we're going to allow a line from a well to go inside a home as well as our <clears> municipal water, a, a lot of homes have bladder tanks inside. Yes. So I, I believe the line can go into the house and then come back out. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, we don't promote it. In this case, we are capping all the wells. Okay. So it will be up to the homeowner if they. I mean, they'll have to pull a plumbing permit and have it all. And and we. The homeowners are pulling plumbing permits, so plumbing inspector will inspect them. That might be something we want to look at too. Right. I think so. Yeah. We're inviting ourselves for cross connection. I, mm -hmm. Once that, once we all, once the township leaves the premises, it doesn't take much to connect those lines. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. Right. So what what is another option for that then? Is there? Well, the, well abandonment's the only other option, but I don't believe we have anything to require well abandonment. Let's uh, put that on our future positioning. Well, we can ask for, yeah, Mr. Mr. Lima. Laddie, is that true? Well, it's, I, I don't believe that we do have that requirement at this time. It is, but it's something that you should consider. I know that in the past, um, when there have been conversions from wells, I know that residents have wanted to keep that, that, that well available for landscaping, yeah. for example. But Mr. Kent's right. I mean, it... it you, you, have a, you have two problems. First of all, you have a problem of, of contamination. 
And then number two, you have uh, the ability for them to, to switch back and forth between water and well. They could potentially run our water on their lawn. I mean, it, there's all sorts of possibilities for it. But, it. but it seems like something that you want to study because I know it's fairly popular when it happens. And uh, maybe a, a, a pro-con list of, of um, possibilities is something you want to look at. And we can create some language that would prevent it if you want it. I think it's something we need to have on a future agenda for uh, right. our future position. Mr. Limita? In my uh, previous um, municipality, they did allow you to maintain it for bladder tank inside to go through, but then you subjected yourself to a routine inspection annually mm -hmm. for the cross-connection program. Uh, so it would depend on how important it was to you because then you were going to be paid for the to require the DPW to do a cross-connection inspection at your home, you'd have to allow them in so that they could inspect it to make sure that there was no possibility of, of, of contamination. Mr. Massey? I have a question for uh, the superintendent. On that same note, uh, the inspection is done uh, without notice? Well, you, you can know because you have to uh, arrange to be able to get into somebody's home. So, uh, but it, I think it would be more work than it was worth for them to go disconnect plumbing once a year and, and connect it. I mean, somebody right. could always conceivably do it, but. There might be some ways to put some seals on or who knows. But Sounds like to Something worth studying anyways, Mr. Laddie. One of the things that, that happens, and this is sometimes people probably Director Sears can talk about this, is people will, if they, if we, they do convert to municipal water and they do want to use the water for landscaping, they're paying not only a, a water charge, but they're paying a sewer charge associated with that. And there's a desire sometimes of people, they want to be able to separate those things. And so the well, I think, has helped them in the past. I think there are ways to handle it currently, but it may be expensive to try to separate the water that's actually used for irrigation purposes very interesting topic and people are yeah are we're so we're good on these houses in terms of uh they're capping all the wells correct but uh but we need, we need to take a look at it and have it on our future positioning i think to study miss lane i know uh from having a home that had to have a well capped make sure we get the permits and everything complete with the health department. Well, and, and I want to be clear, the wells aren't being abandoned. They're just being capped inside the homes. Oh, okay. So we're not abandoning the wells with this money. Uh, we would right. be doing two houses if that were the case <laughs> instead of yeah. five houses. Okay. So we are not abandoning the wells. We are capping them, but we can absolutely look at instituting some kind of an inspection program. I know there are homes out in the township that currently have a well for irrigation and public water. And I totally get your concern, and uh, I think it's valid, definitely worth looking into. Any other concerns? Okay, thank you very much, thank Mr. You. Sears. Item C, uh, the board will receive information on a SAW grant award received for the asset management program from the ME MDEQ. Uh, Mr. Potter, did or Mr. Sears, did you want to comment on that as well? Good evening. Good evening. Um, in 2013, we wrote a SAW grant, and SAW stands for Stormwater Asset Management and Wastewater Program Grants. Um, essentially, it was a grant program that the state started. It was $450 million over four years that was given to communities. If you were a regular community, you had to have a 10% match to go with it. If you were a disadvantaged community, there was no match for that money. They received, I think, $600 million in requests for that $450 million. So they had a lottery to distribute those funds. When the lottery came out, Grand Blanc Township was like 10th from last. So there was, it looked like there was no possibility of us getting a grant. And the grant was for fall of 2013, fall of 2014, fall of 2015 in fall of 2016, and we didn't receive a grant. Well, some more funds were allocated to that grant, so now in the fall of 2017, we're in line to get um, a little over a million dollars with a 10% match. Um, the grant offer came in a letter. We'll be getting the actual grant documents in late November, early December, um, with the grant process starting the first of the year. 
There's two things that you need to be aware of, though, in, in terms of the, of the grant. There's two conditions that they've put on the grant process in the last five years that weren't there when we started. The first one is that at the two-and-a-half-year point of this three-year grant, you have to provide them with the asset management plan that you've projected, the cost that you've projected, the rates that you currently have, and if there's a gap between the rates that you currently have and the rates that you're projecting with your asset management plan, you have to fund 10% of that difference the first year. Now, for communities that have difficulty with their existing rates and their fund balances, this is an issue. Here, I don't believe we have an issue. I think our financial plan's in solid shape, our fund balance is in solid shape, so I wouldn't anticipate that condition being any, any issue for the township but I wanted you to be aware of it. The second issue is that at the end of the three-year period, we have to certify that we completed the asset management plan and we have to keep a copy of that asset management plan here for 15 years. So it's basically a record-keeping thing, but the vast majority of the asset management work that we're doing is all GIS-based. So it'll be here, it'll be taken care of by the GIS staff, by the DPW staff, so I think we have a good mechanism for making sure that it's here for 15 years. It's not like we have a book on a shelf someplace that, you know, hey, somebody go find that asset management here. The state's here, you know. So ours is all GIS based. So I don't see us having a problem having that here on, on any type of inspection that they might have. So I would recommend that you accept the grant. Um, it'll be a million dollars over a three-year period. Um, it's also the way the grant was written, it's any costs that you incurred after January of 2013. So they go back to the beginning of the grant period. So there are some costs that we spent that we can recoup in asset management tasks that we've done already. So as we start looking at this in the next month and a half or so, waiting for the grant funds to be available, we'll review the costs that we've done in asset management, what we can be reimbursed for. They've also changed some of the rules. For instance, when we wrote the grant, you were eligible to buy a GIS server with that grant money. They've changed that. You can't, no, can't any longer buy a grant, I mean, buy a server. So that's $8,000 that was in the grant. And they said we can transfer that cost to some <coughs> other task. We just can't use it for that money, that particular task. So there'll be some rearranging of the original budget that we had in 2013 as compared to what the budget will be for this grant going forward. But we'll be working on that again in the next couple of months, and we'll bring it back to the board when we get all those details worked out with the state. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Kent. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Potter, the, the last time we did the SAW project, that was Sun Valley? Was that the subdivision that we did, we did this? That was SQIP. <laughs> there's oh, was there's all these acronyms. Okay. SWQIS. That was, that was actually, that came out of a different grant that we okay. had. We got in 2005. Yes. And through 2009, and then as a product of that grant, we had, to, we had to do a project. The project that we ended up doing was the SQUIF project that took sump pumps and footing drains yes. out of the sewer and took, put them into the, the storm drain. So that was the SQUIF loan. Hey, hey. Th then what, what does this one do? What this is, is a grant. You, what is this? What is Specifically this? to build an asset management plan okay. that the board's already okay. directed okay. us to do yes. Yes. last yes. year that we started on right. this. We've already spent, yes. I don't know, seventy, eighty, hundred thousand dollars on it. We'll pull those invoices out. So now we're going to get reimbursed for the work that you're already going to do yes. over the next three years. Perfect. I was cross-connecting the two grants. Yes. <laughs> See how easy it is? Well, and the other thing is the, the <laughs> CDBG money that you're spending on for these homes. All that water main was put in with CDBG yeah, yes, funds. Yes, yeah. So this does get our grant towards that uh, plan that we, right. we've been talking about. So we're getting about. reimbursed for all the money that we'd already intended to spend. Which when we go out to bond or yes. what have you, that will come in very handy, I take it. Because the state, the state in particular is going to require any SRF funding, any, any kind of low interest loans are going to be, going to have to have a asset management plan in place in order to, to help with bonding as well then? Absolutely. Yeah. That was one of the main reasons we looked at it because of the right. Valley extension. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, okay. congratulations to our township for yes. getting a million dollar grant. Uh, <laughs> we'll Thank take those. every once in a while, right? We'll Thank take you. those every month of the year. Thank you for all your hard work on this project because yeah. I know you. it's been a long yeah. project. When did yes. you start this project, Dan? We wrote the grant in 2013, late 2012, early 2013. 
kept getting turned down. So some things take a little bit of time, but persistence. Yeah, persistence right. pays off. So thank you to you and our DPW department. Okay. Next item on our agenda is the uh, regarding zoning issues. And item A, the board will consider a motion to grant an extension of the conditional rezoning for 5055 uh, Perry Road for construction of a Speedway gas station. We have with us uh, actually Mr. LaValle. Uh, if anybody has any questions for this development, uh, it's an extension that's already been approved in the past. Yes, Mr. Massey? I have a question. Sure. Where is this location at in Woods? Northeast. Corner of uh, Northeast. Perry Northeast. Road Northeast. and Belsey. There's a, a field there. Oh, yeah. Um, the Northeast across from that Perry assisted Belsey. living and also that Wine Barrel Plaza North. where the pizza place East is. East Corner? It's vacant. That's vacant now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Vacant. Northeast Corner. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Any questions that anybody has? Mr. LaValle, I'm sure would we'll be glad to answer them, but otherwise, uh, we We've already voted on this in the past years, yes. So this has already yeah. been approved? Yes. And right. It's just an extension, yes. Okay. We got you. Okay, Mr. so we'll... Chair, I yes. have a question. Hasn't this idea been around for a while? Yes, just uh, we need to... Uh, what they're asking for is that we grant an extension. I don't know. Mr. Laddy, do you well, have they, any comments? They, just, they haven't had a, have the opportunity uh, to, to execute the project yet. The, the approval, approvals are in place. I think they're in... The, the two properties are in different stages of, of internal funding and execution. This is just allowing them to postpone the actual physical construction uh, until a time when they're ready. Oh, okay. okay. And the second item is of a similar nature. It's uh, basically the speedway at 1435 Hill Road, which is on the corner of Hill and Ali Drive, mm -hmm. right near 475. Um, right, across, that that? right across from Applebee's. On Hill Road. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's the existing station, right? And, right. Yes. It's going to be all tore down and remodeled. Oh, okay. We'll Rebuilt. Okay. Yeah. So they're asking for an extension on both those, unless anybody has any questions. I guess, um, like I said, Mr. LaValle's here, but any questions or issues on those? Okay. We'll vote on those on Thursday. Item C uh, the board will consider a motion to accept the Planning Commission recommendation to adopt. The proposed rezoning, and I think everybody has zoning map amendments, of two parcels in the area commonly referred to as Technology Village, uh, from Research and Development to Technology Park and Technology Village Center. Mr. Laddie, any comments? Or? Just last month, we, we actually approved the text or the regulations, and then this month, uh, just because of notice provisions, the, the actual map lagged behind. So this is the second step of the process. And again, uh, tremendous credit to uh, the Planning Commission and Giffels Webster for getting this in place. This is really, in my opinion, very important to the development of Tech Village. I know that uh, we've, uh, Mr. Lima and I have attended a, a couple of grand openings uh, in the past two weeks. And I know Tech Village has been a uh, topic of discussion amongst uh, people there, and uh, they're excited about the fact that uh, we're moving forward on it. So uh, I think if it would have been available, we probably would have had a few tenants. <laughs> so with that, uh, we'll move to the next item, our future positioning. And uh, the board will review the 2018 proposed budget. And I think what Mr. Lima is going to be looking for is how we want to approach this. So I think there's a variety of ways we can do that, but we have a few new board members and a few veterans. So, Mr. Lima, so I guess what I'm looking for from the board is some direction on how you guys want to roll this out. You know, we obviously have until December 15th to approve the budget um, for the state, but uh, in the past, uh, you know, with every board, you try to figure out what's the best way to deliver the information or how you guys want to receive it. And there's any number of ways we can do it. We can um, look at it overall on Thursday night and kind of do uh, go through the narratives. What I need from you is do you need the individual department heads here for Thursday night? Do we need to schedule uh, a certain amount of time? Would you like to set specific budget meetings outside of our regular meetings? I'm really looking for some direction. 
Now, what we've done in the last couple of years is we've gone through the review of the overall budget. Like for Thursday night, we'll take the actual, you guys all got hard copies of the budget. You know, we've made some changes with some contract uh, salary adjustments and things, but we won't update that until we get through it the first time and we'll see if there's anything. And really what I'm looking for, for Thursday night is some feedback from the board on, uh, you know, would you like the department heads here on Thursday night in mass so that they can answer any questions. You've got each individual department's narratives that's been included with their budget request. You see uh, what I approved in that budget request. And, uh, you know, obviously I need to make sure that we're achieving the goals that the board has set forth. Um, are we spending the money like you want us to? Are we allocating for 2018 where you guys wish the money to be allocated? And this is our opportunity to discuss it. So um, I've been, you know, I've had 16 budget sessions with my prior municipality. Um, it, that lasted three hours each, and I, I mean, it, it can be anywhere in between, and it's about the comfort level. We have new board members here that may be a little bit less comfortable. Typically, we don't go line by line. Um, it's a cost center budget. We look at it as a cost center. Are you okay with the treasurers, with the clerks, with the superintendents, with finance, with, you know, and, and we go through that way. Um, we'd rather not have to make you have multiple three-hour meetings to get through it but again your comfort level is where our, is where my direction needs to be so if tonight if you guys would just let me know what you expect from us for thursday first off and then where you want to take it from there mr ken i'll get out in front of this a little bit right um mr lemith is charged with meeting with department heads developing this budget i think in my opinion I've reviewed, reviewed it. I've reviewed it by department, revenue, expense. Um, I can't second guess what Mr. Lemith has worked with his department has to, to get where we need to be. And I said $13 million earlier, and I really meant uh, $13 million was revenue and general fund, but we have a, almost a $15 million budget here. And uh, all I ask is that we find that $180,000, which I know we will because we – as we've stated, it's been over, it was over three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars last year, whatever we contributed. Um, but I don't see the need for grueling sessions of line item reviews of second guessing the reviews that Mr. Lemitz has already had with the department heads. That's that's how I in the last couple of years the way we've adopted this through presentation in advance, as Kathy has done, she did that last couple of years, us to review it. And then we could do a little discussion on Thursday night. Maybe something that's really bothering somebody, right? Other than that, I, I think that went and has been going very well. And in fact, on boards that I was on in the past, where we went through many, many hours of wasted time of line item reviews, we did more budget amendments at the end of the year under those processes than we have the last couple of years. Proof, kind of proof in the pudding, right? Very good point, Mr. Ken. I think, you know, and the other thing is that uh, Mr. Lima Day has an open door that uh, I'm sure if any of our board members had, you know, in-depth questions on any department, uh, Mr. Lima would be glad to set up a meeting with that department head and go through their budget, you know, with a finer detail. Um, so that's always available as a course of action, too, for any of our board members. And I think everybody's pretty well comfortable with, with doing that if, if they you know, so desire even now. So um, I, I tend to agree with you that uh, we've charged Mr. Limita with um, meeting with their department heads, setting the budgets, and uh, and moving forward. And, and we've done pretty well in the past year here. So I'd like to continue along that vein. Mr. Massey. Chair, I agree with uh, Trustee Clark Kent. I don't think we need to uh, analyze line by line. We just look at the top number. And if there's some questions about the top number, we deal with that. When you get in the line, line item, I mean line by line, and you you actually question somebody's integrity. Yes. That's the way I look at it. Okay, did you make a good judgment? I'm not in that position to say that you made a good judgment or a bad judgment. I'm in the position to look at the top number, and that's it. And that isn't to say we aren't going to go over yes. it. Yes. I mean, we're going we're gonna to go over it, but. Absolutely. Uh, to, to spend you know several three-hour meetings uh, pouring over line by line. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think you know what we're talking about is I don't know do we need to have the department heads here for going through it or I think if we have any questions Mr. Lima can answer them and if, if 
he isn't able to answer them, I guess he can bring the department head into the next meeting. But right. I think, you know, sounds like we have a consensus amongst us. I don't know. Mr. Thomas, do you have any thoughts? I haven't done this, so okay. what about you? You know, one of the things I would like to see is that if we're going to do just a, sounds like we're just going to do a rough overview of the highlights of each. Is that the way that you're playing? Sounds like discussing yeah. it. Would it be feasible if we waited it until we can get a hold of uh, Trustee Mansour so he's here? Uh, yeah. Trustee Mansour is going to be here the fourth uh, Tuesday. He, as everyone knows, he's uh, right. um, also participating yeah. in the yeah. citizen planner. Is it okay if we delay until Trustee Mansour is here? So Mr. I, Lemina. I think a good suggestion then, um, based on uh, Trustee Thomas's um, query, is that why don't we take a look on on uh, Thursday's overview just from the process itself? We're going to talk about the time frames, what it's going to do, how we work it, how we how you guys finalize it, so that we stay within our government mandated timelines. Uh, we can go through the narratives because um, just to see if there's anything in the narrative that anyone you know disagrees with or that we needed to allocate more money. Uh, that would give us at least some feedback that we could probably rerun another copy before that Tuesday meeting and get it out to you guys and then have hard copies for you for that Tuesday. But like I said, we made some changes um, to board approved salary adjustments with the independent contracts. And then if there's anything, I mean, you guys may say, no, I think, I mean, there were some things in there that I bumped up uh, Parks and Recreation for $10,000 um, for a specific reason that Kay had asked me about that. You know, I would certainly, the city's going to match it with that same 60-40 split. And um, there's just a few things that when we go through, I want to highlight saying, like, take a look at these. Do you guys agree or disagree? And if you uh, disagree, and part of it is because you have to remember with, I saw your reaction, Trustee Thomas, you have to remember that with the changes that we made in our water, the, the size of the meters that feed parks and recreation, um, they're going to have an impact that's about ten thousand dollars <laughs> uh, so there's some method to our <laughs> uh, but there is there's a there's just any of those that could be glaring examples maybe you guys somebody here thinks we should put fifty thousand dollars towards the perry homestead as an example and i didn't do that so if any of those are glaring that pop out at you thursday let me know we will try to make some adjustments, rerun um, version two, and we'll have it ready for that following Tuesday meeting when Trustee Mansour will be in attendance. That sounds like a plan. And then Perfect. you would well, actually probably review the whole thing for Trustee Massey at that time, right? Mansour, I mean, Mansour. Yeah, absolutely. We can, you know, and I'll send something out to him ahead of time just so that we cover the narratives that we look through. Here's are some of the questions that came up from your fellow board members and then why we reran it like we did based upon any questions that came up based on the narratives and in the direction and then we just make sure that we're achieving the goals that the board wants to achieve and that's the biggest thing when you guys look at this it's are we doing what we're supposed to be doing with the money and if we're not that this is where we need to know so that we can fix it uh, moving forward okay sounds good under operational issues the board will consider a motion to approve the installation of a SMS access control system Integrated into the existing police department system purchased from FBH Architectural Security for $23,254 and authorized township superintendent to execute all related contracts and documents. This was budgeted, a budgeted capital project for 2017. Mr. Lemina? This came about after last year when uh, officers from the Grand Blanc Township Police Department held some ALICE training, active shooter training here at the township hall so that we could see and test our own responses if it were to occur and how we would, would respond to that. Some of the feedback that we got back from the two individuals who ran it was that we should really look at more secure uh, access in the building and what we, one of the ways that we could do that um, is to put those key card uh, locks in place so the auditorium doors uh, and the exterior doors. It does a couple things. When an employee leaves, we can change their access code immediately. We can deactivate that card. This is the exact same system for those of you who've been in the police department. It's the exact same system that they use over there. Uh, so your ID card uh, basically will be your key card, including with uh, board members. When they come on board, we're going to give you an ID card. With that key card, you'll be able to access the exterior doors to come in. 
Um, the other feature of it is it has a, a panic button, a stop button, so that we can have, go on to lockdown. And that was one of the concerns that we had here is we don't have the ability, we'd have to run around and try to lock these front doors where uh, if we have it up in the front and there was uh, something going on out in the parking lot, for example, somebody can hit that stop button and we go on to an automatic lockdown. It can alarm next door and we can have officers over here truly ready to respond while the building is on lockdown so we don't have anybody else breaching the building from the front. Um, say we saw uh, a man with a gun or something out front. Um, so there's a lot of abilities in there. The auditorium doors was one of the things that they noted is that if somebody comes through the front door right now, uh, unfettered access, they can walk in, walk through, back into the finance department. I mean, without ever being stopped by anybody, it's just if they walk through like they know what they're doing. Um, so it's about securing the building more and then, uh, again, the, the ability to turn off somebody's access. But you go onto the computer and you, you remove their access um, right now. And it, it, if you have a disgruntled employee leave, for example, they're automatically. We don't have to wait for FBH to come out the next day or anything else to try to, to change the locks. And we're going to have to change locks anyway. We found out over the just most <laughs> recent times that... The current lock system that we have, it's just old, it's worn out. So they're having trouble finding parts. Um, and so it's time for us to change the locks. Well, if we're gonna do it, why don't we do it and do it the right way and use the suggestions that we got from our own police department on uh, securing the building a little more. As well as outside groups being able to use the room, uh, also contractors, allowing them access to certain portions of the building for work. You could, you could give somebody, if you had uh, the painters coming in and they were gonna work an evening or whatever, you'd be able to give them a a card that would allow them access into the building for that period of time. They're going to be here one night or two mm -hmm. nights, and then it automatically is turned off so that they no longer have access. Right. Uh, rather than having a key or having somebody here, you know, to you know monitor, be lock up after. So I mean, I or think any other temporary help right now, you have to have a pocket full of keys to be able to get into. Mr. Mass, you had a question. Yeah, I have a question for the Superintendent. Is is does do cameras come with the system? No, this is strictly the locks on the doors. Okay. Are we looking into down the road that we may need cameras? We have we have security cameras throughout the campus right now. Um, unfortunately, like Supervisor Bennett will be happy to tell you, um, a couple nights or a couple weeks ago, we looked at a we were having a door lock issue, and then we went over to he went over to uh, look in dispatch at the quality of our cameras. Now, currently in your capital improvements. Uh, plan you have $7,500 a year budgeted for camera replacement ongoing so that we're continually updating them. Um, our system needs to be completely redone. We spoke in our executive uh, board uh, session with, with uh, Mr. Laddie this morning about maybe it's time for us to do an IT audit, a complete IT audit of the entire um, operation. Uh, and get some some feedback on it because I want to make sure that we're using the correct servers, the correct cameras, you know, uh, and that can be part of our IT overall IT uh, review. I did one of these up north and found out some information as far as you know w when you think you're truly secure, but you're only using servers, and should you have a cloud-based backup? And they just do a complete thorough review of the systems that you're using, your operations. They look at the people you got working it. And they make some suggestions, and I think one of those things is probably going to be our security cameras. There's no reason why we don't have a top-notch security camera system over there. If they're in dispatch, they should be able to see crystal clear with HD cameras anywhere on this campus at any given time so that they would be able to note if there was something going on. Or even with the technology today, you can look at it on your laptop or your phone, you know, and uh, remotely be able to access it. I know the camera system, I believe, that we are having installed at the Parks and Rec will enable the police to uh, survey that on you know, through the internet, whether it's on their phone or a computer. But I think the phone system also is something to add into that IT audit because the the new phone systems are eliminating phone lines and uh, pretty much going via internet. But I would be in favor of looking into that, Dennis, the, uh, the, the IT audit. I think that would be a great uh, thing for us to investigate. All the new phone systems are going to iCloud. Right. It's housed in the cloud and... <laughs> it's you're not paying would probably cut our cost I was thinking of that during Mr. Ostek's uh, presentation that um, I was at a presentation this past weekend where uh, it would cut our phone bill probably more than in half and with as many lines as we have here that could be substantial 
Good question, Mr. Massey. Any other question on that key card program? I think uh, the security, I mean, they're just, you know, not having to have a pocket Absolutely. full of keys and temporary help. Uh, if we wanted to have, you know, interns or co-op students, uh, temporary help of any kind, uh, we can give them access without having to change out the keys. And once in a while we run into an issue where which key do we use for this door? <laughs> so, okay. So we'll talk about that more on Thursday, but uh, if anybody has any questions in the meantime, I'm sure Dennis can fill you in. Item B, the board will consider a motion to approve Rowe Professional Services Company's uh, construction management proposal for the Heritage Park Saginaw Road water main. Um, I think that's a looping project. I was going to say, yes. Um, <laughs> for an amount not to exceed $19,950 and authorize the township superintendent to execute all related contracts and documents. Uh, Mr. Sears, any comments on this project? Uh, good evening again. No comments, but I'm uh, available to answer any questions. The scope of services was included in the packet. This basically just allows road to perform contract administration, uh, the uh, survey work they do out in the field, and uh, also as build preparation among several other things that you've seen in the packet. I can answer any questions you might have regarding this though. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Massey. One question. Sure. Uh, expound on what you really mean about the amount not to exceed $19,950. That means that's the amount Roe was going to do this work for. They won't go a penny over it. This is like what Kathy was talking about. The finance department actually tracks these projects. So they'll have this amount and there won't be an avoid. And actually Roe tracks it down to the penny also. It's funny, I got an invoice a couple of weeks ago for a project. It was like for $4.32 or something like that. I don't even know what, it, you know, it was for something small like a mailing or something like that. But they track it right down to the penny. So an amount to exceed, they won't exceed that amount. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sears. The next item on the agenda, uh, item C, the board will consider adopting a resolution for the amendment of the special assessment role for the Concord Green Special Assessment District to account for the revised estimate for the project in the amount of $508,000 allocated in an amount of $9,584.90 per parcel. That's not including interest. Mr. Limita, anything on that? It's, I mean, Mr. realistically, we, we uh, as you guys are probably aware, the Concord Green project um, was a little bit delayed and it's not done. We were hoping that we would have a, a uh, final uh, amount. Um, Treasurer Guzak's been waiting on this and it looks like we're probably, um, Director Sears, we're, we're still probably a couple weeks out uh, minimum we probably won't see that final bill until November sometime but Treasurer Guzak in the meantime has to has to act to be prepared to move forward um, and so we thought uh, since we know that it was approved we can go up to five hundred eight thousand dollars and that's why that amounts before you it's a change from what we had before next item item D the board will consider adopting a resolution authorize the issuance of special assessment bond series 2017 General obligation limited tax in an amount of 508000 for the proposed uh, street repair and repaving in the Concord Special Assessment District. So that's tied in with that. So, well, it sounds similar. The first one is the amendment to the special assessment role. And then the second resolution before you is authorizing the issuance of the special assessment bonds. Okay. Mr. Guzak? Yeah, and, and what we'll end up doing with this is that it's up to 508 and we think it might be coming down. So that way uh, we found out a way that we can actually not get it on the tax bill and still mail it out separately. We found a way, the deputy found out a way through our BSNA system to issue a separate bill. So that way we won't have to go through the estimation process and then paying back so we can have an exact number. So that way, the 508's in place, but we're hoping that we can come in lower than that, but allows us to go to the 508. Okay. <clears throat> I have a question. Mr. Manson. Uh Expounding on what the treasurer commented on the tax bill. Right. Okay. Well, normally what happens is if you can get the final bill quick enough, 
we can actually put it on the tax bill in December. But this one here has gone over, and there's a time limit of when we have to have our tax bill submitted to our processor to print it. And we're probably going to miss that deadline. We're hoping we can still meet it, but now we've figured out a way that if we can't meet that deadline, we can put the regular tax bill out without this assessment on it and then issue a separate bill that would go to all the residents in that, that uh, taxing body with a memo stating, you know, with a letter stating all the facts. And so they'll have a bill this year, but we'll have the exact number and not an estimate that we have to juggle and do a lot of rearranging. I have a question, uh, Mr. Treasurer. My question is, if you have, just for talking purpose, huh? if you have 100 homes in a subdivision and for what a, for whatever unknown reason, you're down to 50 homes, what happens? If you have 100 in, what, in the taxing assessment body you're talking about? Yes, and you go down to 50, what happens? Uh, well, the only way you could go down, go ahead, Mr. You're gonna reassess the 50. If you, right. you're gonna spread the cost, the whatever the, the project cost ends up being at any point in time during the assessment period, you're gonna spread that among the, the existing homes in the assessment. So if you start out with 100 and you lose 50, the other 50 are going to have to make up that difference. How would you lose 50 is what I'm just wondering. Right. Now. Do you mean like if they... Well, I said a hypothetical question, so I, okay. I, All right. I, I give you a hypothetical answer. Right. No. Well, we, we've got, you know, some areas where if somebody owns more than one lot, you know, in that case, there might be 50 property owners, you know. We've lost, to the best of my knowledge, in, in any given project, we've lost one or maybe two assessments for from bankruptcy processes okay, right. or a tax tribunal reversal so your hypothetical is extreme but I mean, <laughs> but it illustrates the point yeah. and that is that and, and mr guzak makes the point too you guys pass these resolutions we obtain the funding but we have the ability to to keep a running balance increase or decrease uh the assessments mm -hmm. over the assessment life which is we have 10 years here so we're always going to be able to to make up what we're behind if we need to, it, it, we, it's very, very rare that we ever need to, but we can if we have to. So a bankruptcy could take somebody off that role? You could. But usually somebody will buy the property and whoever buys that property will have to pay for that road. Right, it, we, we had a couple of those happen in the 2008, 9, 10 okay. era, but, but it's very small really. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, the statute's flexible enough to allow you to make up for it. Right, okay. Is, is there another, Mr. Kent? Is, I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Is this uh, the ten percent rule too? Uh, we're, it, okay. You're, you're exact. We're we're right at ten percent. If we exceed, if the project exceeds five hundred eight thousand, which is exactly ten percent of our last estimate, and I was it four sixty four. Four sixty two. Yeah. Then uh, then we're required to have an, an additional public hearing where the folks come in and we have to explain it to them. I think what we're going to do now, even though we passed the resolution, we're under the ten percent. Probably we'll have a final reconciliation and we'll probably explain to them what happened because there were a couple of things that happened in the project that, that caused it to be a little more expensive. Uh, but so we're still with the, I'm sorry. We're still within 10%. But pretty close to 10. We're going to be, we think we'll be below, but we, right. the 508 is basically 10% on the button. Okay. Moving on to the next item, and it's uh, what we're hearing from the community. Um, one of the things that, uh, and also future agenda items, I think one of the things we spoke about in our executive uh, board meeting was that uh, we wanted to talk maybe in the future about uh, our policy for installing uh, water lines when there's a total rebuild of, uh, of streets in a subdivision or particular area. I'm sure Mr. Lehman is aware of that, but I just thought I'd bring it to the board's attention that we want to look at that policy. Um, what else? Anybody hearing that we need to address? Mr. Kent? Uh, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who lives in Williamsburg Farm. I, I normally come down Maple Road, so I haven't been traveling Hill Road much lately. And uh, they said, have you been down Hill Road lately? You know, they resurfaced between right. Belsey and Center Road, mm -hmm. right? And I said, no, I haven't. And they said, it is the it is the worst repaving surfacing of any any road they've ever seen resurfaced. So tonight, I drove that way coming here, right. and it is bad. Day. It is a terribly lined. Mr. Sears and Mr. Lima, you get a chance tomorrow. You know, I know you guys see daily from time to time, and the road commission folks and those guys. 
it, it to me just visibly looks really bad for it's not not bad feeling it wasn't a rough road by any means but i'm concerned about something as porous as that looks it looks very porous <laughs> that that we're going to just going to disintegrate in a short period of time that's i've never seen anything like it mr thomas yeah, on that point but on that point where they did use something a different type of uh surface in right. the uh left turn lane in the passing lane it's uh i don't know what i know it's something new that david arceo that's oh. our commissioner was telling me about but in the passing lane it's really porous but it's something to do with the slip guard oh so it's kind of yeah I, 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 I drive it every day um <laughs> but it's pretty but the lining is a real disaster yeah. what i heard and I talked to Claire Klein about this, and I was wondering if you could follow up with, also with me. Have you heard any results from Office Park, uh, the letter that we sent out? Might have had some limited, but Mr. Sears? I've kind of been getting those emails and uh, phone calls. So and far, we've had four uh, property owners that called and expressed that they do not want it to move forward, and one that has called and said they do want it to move forward. Okay. So um, I could have prepared. I, I don't have enough of the property owners yet. I was gonna give a report, but since I've only heard from five of them, I held back on that. But as soon as I get the majority or uh, one way or the other, I'll definitely report that to the board. Because if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, this is a brand new process that we're trying, we voted right. on, right? We're just yes. trying to get some input from them. Mm -hmm. Correct. One other thing that, uh, Mr. Thanks. Sears, the yeah. uh, public hearing for the Dort Highway extension is tomorrow evening. Is that true? The 11th? I believe yeah, it's yeah, on the 11th. Yeah. That's it's what over I'm, at the police department, yeah. Yeah, but tomorrow. it's only on the uh, Correct. environmental it, it's quality. The public tomorrow hearing to, uh, it's an overview over the environmental assessment that yeah. they mm -hmm. just finished right. for the uh, Dort Highway extension. So. The environment, I, I saw actually the copy of it today at the Road Commission, and it's about that thick. Dude, the environmental you assessment. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, that? yeah. But the road, I'll, I'll give you a synopsis is, of it. But the road commissioners uh, and, our, and John Daly will be there for that meeting, Correct. I believe. So yeah. if you have questions about it, they'll be there to ask. What time is the meeting, Mr. 5 p.m., and it's going to be in the uh, conference room for the police department. This will be, this is the environmental assessment. So once mm -hmm. this goes through, we got it back. It is 900 and some pages. Uh, <laughs> Did you read it also? I read it. I, I, put, I put together a Cliff's Notes version of <laughs> that. <laughs> to our highway extension for dummies. But I think the best part is that you're going to hold the open house now, and this gives people the opportunity to weigh in on it, and you can link to it from the gcrc.org website if you really want to read 900 and some pages of environmental assessment. But what's going to come out of this is that we will assume that after they hold their public hearing that they will move this forward with their preferred route and that's the last leg of this journey as far as getting the final piece in and be able to send it in so that we can get the approval for the final route. Uh, and that's what the environmental assessment shows is that what is the preferred route versus if you recall the boards that we had up on it and there was like option you know one two three, one, two, four. three four yeah. or whatever uh, they have that option selected and once that gets approved then that will trigger the ability to act to uh, purchase some of the properties that they're going to need to acquire to complete the construction okay I don't know, did you want to mention this at all dennis or go ahead um, one of the things that uh, this A source, I think everybody has a copy of it, uh, it's distributed throughout uh, southeast Michigan. Uh, one of the uh, businesses that uh, had uh, an opening for their customers uh, was uh, CNX and then also Laird. CNX is a partnership between uh, a German company, Continental, and uh, Next Year, and uh, both of them, you know, as you know, are leaders in the industry, automotive industry. Uh, they formed a third company, uh, CNX, which is located at Embury Road, just a, a dynamite office, as well as Laird um, relocating from another part of the township to uh, off Holly Road. But both of them are recruiting people from throughout the world to, uh, to come to our community. 
And so Mr. Limita is working on uh, a thumb drive that will that we can distribute to those companies and they can give to uh, potential employees that would list all the benefits of, of living in our area and uh, various resources. But in addition to that, other businesses that are looking at trying to locate people to the area, this booklet uh, serves as a guide to them. So realtors, what have you, in southeast Michigan distribute this. And uh, we thought it was important to, to, to highlight some of the features of our township. You'll notice that uh, there's other communities like Washington Township, uh, Rochester Hills, what have you. And so this is the first time that we're going to have actually uh, Grand Blank Township uh, featured in this booklet and uh, for a minimal cost and I mean the I mean it I think we we need to market ourselves and to highlight some of the the value that that we bring to potential residents and business owners mm -hmm. so I think it was a very uh, great effort and we'll continue to build on this Really and that was yeah the plastic is so that it that stands out so too. Yeah. Yeah, that right. was, <laughs> I didn't do that. That's credit where credit is due. <laughs> yes. That was Megan was that uh, Gilman, our administrative <laughs> assistant, who when we got the box of these delivered, she went and found some of these and did it on one and said, "Is this a good idea or not?" So yeah, it's, uh, a, great it's a great idea because it's going to flip your right to Grand Lake Town. <laughs> I've, I've never seen that before. And it, yeah, it's I great. Can't, I can't believe Mr. Bennett. Put them all out of the hundred thousand of these and no, the just your copies. Yeah, just oh just goodness. our copies. <laughs> and somebody needs a copy, we have some here. I think that's uh, probably uh, just it for the Thursday agenda, mm -hmm. and then we'll have written reports uh, from our various department heads. And I don't know if we'll need an executive session or not on on Thursday, but I don't know that we're planning that at this time. So. There's a potential that you might have an executive session on Thursday. I'm just giving you the heads up now, but it will depend on the actions that occur over the next 24 to 48 hours. Wow. I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn. What? Support, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Boy, that's awful cryptic. <laughs>